Good morning. Welcome to Prime Time. Prime Time is a Bethel Library program that's a collaboration between the Friends of the BU Library, Academic Affairs, Andrea Fisher, the Dean of Academic Programs, and other offices on campus, like the Department of Social Work, that celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. So thanks for joining us. Coming up on Tuesday, April 18th, in two weeks, at 11.15 a.m., Dr. Nancy Brule, Professor of Communication Studies, will be sharing her experience with continuing bond theory in her presentation, I Have a Son Named Jacob, Applying the Continuing Bonds Theory. So today, Drs. Edie, Drs. Edie Shapolsky and Samuel Zalanga of Social Work will help identify how neoliberal, neoliberalism impacts social work, practice, and education. And if you would appreciate knowing exactly what the key elements of neoliberal philosophy are and the implications for being human, which I would appreciate knowing about, I understand that they are going to tell us. So let's welcome Dr. Edie Shapolsky and Dr. Samuel Zalanga. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time to come um, and listen to our talk. I'm honored to be able to collaborate on this work with Dr. Samuel Zalanga, who is my friend and really has served as a mentor for me since I came to Bethel um, and helped guide me through my own dissertation and then came to join us in the social work department. So we really appreciate um, his brilliant partnership with us. And he is going to, um, as we, oh, I've got this fancy thing here. So um, our goals for today are to provide first an overview of neoliberalism, and Samuel will take the floor to do that very expertly. And then we're going to talk briefly and explore the relevance and relationship to social work practice. And we've added in some theological considerations um, for us to kind of just briefly touch on. So I will pass the uh, floor over to Samuel, who will start. I want to welcome everybody here, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this with uh, Edie. I want to say that I have taught in Bethel for quite some time, but as a sociology professor. And when I was teaching sociology, one of the things I realized was that there's quite a lot of emotional labor because you can only go so far talking about issues of justice before somebody levels you as this and that. But in social work, given the fact that I grew up very poor in Africa, in the northeastern part of uh, Nigeria, uh, when I came to the United States, I know it's a very rich country, and for many people in Africa, they think it is paradise on earth. But my goal was not to accumulate material things or whatever, but to make a difference in the lives of people. You know? And as I'm getting older, I feel this is the most important thing for me. Even if I become the richest person, when I look around and see the way some people are suffering, it doesn't make me really happy. So in social work, I found out that I could pursue that. I could teach about justice and other things, and it is part of the competency areas and things like that. So I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> that uh, Edie gave me. Now, uh, to begin with, I would just like to look at the history, um, uh, engaging neoliberalism using some stand uh, points. So, as I come into this, just understand that old scholarship is biographical in the sense that I grew up in Africa in a rural community. I never thought I would spend a good part of my life in the United States, but here am I. So, but when I came to uh, Bethel, I became very, I have always been very interested in the evolution of Western thinking. And so I taught Western humanities. And in my view, when you look at uh, the evolution of thinking in Western humanities, you feel like, okay, Given what is happening, either, let's say in the United States, we are the most advanced industrialized nation, okay? If you look at the accumulated wisdom from the ancient time today, you feel like there's something missing. Because if this wisdom has been used, we would be living in a better society than now. And I give you an example there with Plato. Plato has, at a very early time, he was not a Christian, but he said, there's tension in every human being and every human society, whether we allow our appetitive desires to take over our rationality or our heart and soul. And I think this is just a problem that we still have. And it is not just a problem in the West, but in every part of the world you see that if people allow their appetitive desires to take over their reason and their heart, which means reason and their heart is colonized by the desires of the flesh, if you use Christian language or something like that. 
And then you have Aristotle, who just said that you always should go for the mean and don't go for excess. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you go, if you do not go for the mean, uh, either way, when you go to the extreme, you are going to end up in uh, trouble. And then he made the important point that it's not enough to know the truth. You have to habituate yourself. Habituation here means like discipleship. So you can memorize the whole Bible. I don't have problem with that. But if you do not discipline this body to live the truth in the Bible, it's not going to make any difference. Okay? And I think this is an important insight from Aristotle. Romanticism is a critique of, if you like, enlightenment. Enlightenment has made a great contribution to the modern world. But again, in the Western tradition, you still find this romanticism slow down. You know, don't just assume that human beings are all rational. Human beings are much more complex than just being rational. Okay? So there's quite a lot of wisdom there. And then with Sigmund Freud, uh, Civilization and, his, and its Discontent, one of his books, he said the greatest threat to civilize, human civilization is our inability to put sublimate to control our crude instinctual human desires. And these crude instinctual human desires manifest themselves in so many ways. If you read the work of Jonathan Edwards, there's a place where he talks about the theory of affection. But what you see people doing outside there is a projection of something much more deeper in their hearts. Okay? So if I'm somebody who is interested in making money, even if you start talking about the Bible, sooner or later, the conversation is going to revolve around money because that's what my affection is. So and then from the point of view of the history and evolution of Christianity, again, when I think about that, I feel like our problem today is not that Christianity doesn't have the truth. So when I actually reflected on that so much, I started praying, Lord, every day I pray, God, give me the courage. Because I've come to realize that there's quite a lot of knowledge of Christianity, the truth, people know that. Don't tell me that they do not know that. But do they have the courage to live it? Not necessarily so. So take, for instance, St. Augustine. St. Augustine, in his City of God, made two points that I would like to raise here, which are relevant for us. He said, without justice, we're only a gang of robbers. In a society where some people are more powerful than others, I don't care what that society is. If some people are more powerful than others, if there's no justice, it's just like a gang of robbers because the powerful will take advantage of the weak. Okay? And then he also made the point uh, about libido dominandi. He said the Romans have courage, but their courage is libido dominandi. Libido dominandi means the last to conquer and dominate. Okay? But we need the courage of humility. We need the courage to care for others. Okay? So, and then from an anthropological point of view, you're going to see that there are different ways that human beings organize themselves. Sometimes we feel like there's only one way, but in reality, there are several ways that do that. But sometimes when we talk, we pretend as if that's the only way. And I think this has become a means of control and domination. So having said that, what, what I'm trying to get at with those things is just that for me as a person, even though I'm not a person of Western ancestry, I feel like when I read the wisdom there, I just feel like there's something missing. If you look at sometimes what is discussed on TV or something like that, you feel like, wow, since the time of Socrates to date, and we're still talking about this? No, we should be doing something better. We should be discussing something better, okay? The same thing from a biblical perspective. Now, the origin and faces of neoliberalism. Some of you may be uh, unsure of what this neoliberalism is, but I'm going to talk about it later. And we do not have the time, so I would like to rush through this so that Edie can come on. But the debate, that started when, uh, if you want to understand the origins of neoliberalism, it's a debate in Western civilization between individual liberties and the common good. Individual liberties means you just want to pursue your freedom. And there's quite a lot of debate about that. I don't want to digress because that would take too much of our time. But the idea is, should I just pursue my liberty, my freedom, okay, or should I pursue the common good? And if you think about liberty, I think there was, uh, there was a time I was laughing when I saw one of the, I think it was the former U.S. Secretary of State, oh, what's his name? he said, America gives you the freedom to be stupid. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, of course you will pay the cost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So liberty sounds really very interesting. But you know, you see documentary films where people, uh, KKK members with the cross burning and they're saying, amazing grace. So they have the freedom. So this liberty can be anything. If you are gullible, people can just suppress the information and you can just carry, be carried away from that. So liberty is good, but without social responsibility, no, it's not going to take us anywhere. 
So, but the idea of the common good is to say in Africa, there's a term they use Ubuntu, I am because we are. So for instance, if I am working in Bethel and I can pursue my self-interest, but it is going to harm the institution, should I do that? Or should I say, oh, no, no, no. In order for, the, for me to exist, we need the institution to function. So why don't I take that into consideration? So the idea of the common good is therefore very, very important. And this is the tension that still exists even in America today. This idea, the tension between liberties and the common good. And then uh, individual liberty oriented neoliberalism. So there are two different types of, if you like, neoliberalism. One is the one that emphasizes the individual liberties and libertarians do that in the United States. And there was a time I taught a course and one student told me that, do you think some evangelicals are closet libertarians? <laughs> okay, because he saw some similarity there, okay? But the German order liberals, they are also people who are liberals, but they believe that the state should kind of intervene in the economy in some respect. They are not saying they want this kind of big welfare state, but they just believe that sometimes if you just leave everything to the market, you may not be able to realize what you really want to, okay? So, and then the next uh, phase would be uh, the emergence of Mont Pelerin society in 1947. So, to give you an idea of what is happening uh, here, um, Mont Pelerin is a society that emerged in reaction to Ken uh, Keynesian economics. So, what is Keynesian economics? Well, after the second, after the Great Depression in 1929, you know, people started mistrusting the market economy and in the United States we started regulating that and all those sort of things like that. And then during the Second World War, the government of Western Europe and the United States became very active in the economy, regulating the economy because you do not just want to just leave it like that. And then after the Second World War, you know, there was an era in the United States that is called post-war prosperity. Okay? So there was a lot of prosperity. But this prosperity, can you remember the L LBJ had this war on poverty, all those kind of things. This all indicated big government, big government. The government was expanding. And some people started thinking that this is a violation of their liberty. Because this government is this big government is maintained through taxes. And libertarians will tell you that. And don't argue, don't get into argument with libertarians unless you are well prepared because they're very logical. They'll say, uh, do you control your you control your body? Do you agree with me? You say, yes, I control my body, my body. Okay. If you control your body, do you control your labor? You say, yeah, 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 I control my labor. It sounds good. But if you control your labor, then anything your labor produces is an extension of your body. So anybody who taxes it is stealing from you. Okay? So taxation is kind of like you're taking away something from somebody by force. So you can see here that these libertarians are concerned about big government because big government is maintained through taxes. Okay, and this has been the source of controversy in the United States for quite some time. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, whose ideas shaped the post-war prosperity, the question of state intervention in the economy and taxing to pay this and that, he was not anti-capitalist. He was just saying that if you just allow capitalism to be on its own without regulation, it's going to result in so many crises and inequality, <laughs> and then there will be a lot of some people would become attracted to communism or socialism. So he felt that one of the ways you can uh, ensure that people are not attracted to that is to make sure that there's a system through taxation or something like that that keeps a balance. It's not like everybody is going to be equal, but at least you're going to maintain some kind of uh, balance in the society. So that was really where, okay, that was where neoliberalism really uh, started. So let me give you some key examples of the ideas of neoliberalism so that uh, later on, uh, Edie is going to talk about the kind of application to social work. Okay, so the key elements now. The dirigent state is retreat. Dirigent state means a state that is very strong and trying to kind of restructure or regulate the economy. So, for instance, the state that tried to introduce uh, civil rights movement in the United States is considered to be a dirigent state because it's like restructuring. You're saying that there's something wrong, so you want to correct it. Well, neoliberals would not agree with that. And there are neoliberal economists who just feel that the government has no business telling who should be employed or something like that, okay? So that's one thing. Second, the emergence of technocratic management. Uh, the market, according to these people, is more democratic than democracy. Many people do not know that, but the neoliberals say that. The market is more democratic than democracy. Why? Because 
in real democracy, you are represented by somebody. But in the real market, I have my checkbook, I have my wallet here, I go straight, I make my own decisions. Okay? So this, it is more democratic. So that's why they emphasize the market more than democracy. So maybe they feel like we should just have democracy because they want to play around with our intelligence. But the real democracy is in the market because when you have your checkbook, you go straight, you make your own decisions. And then the market as God, that's another thing. This is something that is really very uh, interesting also. Um, the idea here is just that I don't want to digress so much, but if you understand neoliberalism really very well, the price system under capitalism replaces the role of the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat again. The price system under neoliberalism replaces the role of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because uh, in Christianity, we believe that we are fallible people. You cannot say that because you are educated, you are smart or whatever, you don't, need, you, are, you don't need the guidance of God or whatever. You always rely on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, right? Because you have inadequate knowledge or something like that. Well, the economists to neoliberals will tell you that we all have inadequate knowledge. You can have knowledge about the economy, about all these prices and everything. So what happens is that the market through the price system aggregate information about different people's demand and supply. And when this information is aggregated, it is, it is coalesced together and it is kind of elevated. When it is elevated, it becomes like just like the Holy Spirit. If I want to make a decision about something, instead of praying, I can just like, which school am I going to go to? Strictly from the point of view of neoliberal economics, you look at the price system. Okay? For all those kind of things. So many Christians do not understand that. But this is very important. And then the other thing that I want to say very quickly about also is the polarization or prioritization of formal equality and equality of opportunity. Neoliberalism emphasizes uh, formal equality. Formal equality means like in the constitution, this and that, or whatever, we're all equal or something like that. But in reality, what does that mean? It's now getting to 12 noon. There are Americans who live in the richest country. They have not had breakfast. They have not had lunch. But they are citizens of this country, right? But there are people who are going to be arriving at the airport who will be driven in an expensive car because they have the money. In America, we don't discriminate between the dollars spent by people here and the people who come here. So in other words, what this simply means is that we are all equal in this country, but if you don't have the money in the marketplace, you are going to suffer the consequences. It doesn't matter what your race is. And then the prioritization of economic competitiveness. Catherine Tainer, who is a theologian at Yale Divinity School, made this important point. This idea that she wrote a book called uh, Christianity and the New Spirit of Capitalism. And in that book, she said, finance capital disciplines nation. It disciplines organizations. It disciplines individuals. So just as God or Christianity is trying to discipline you, to disciple you, finance capital is also disciplining churches, which is disciplining nations. I wish I can tell you that the disciplining of these nations that is done by finance capital is the same thing as the way Christianity or Jesus would like to discipline you. If it were the case, we can just go and swim in the marketplace because we know that the more we swim in the marketplace, the more we are being transformed and be made to become closer to God. But if you look very closely, you are going to find out that the discipline that the market brings to you in your life or to Christian organization is not the same thing as the one that Christianity will do. And then um, uh, mainstreaming the discourse of personal responsibility. So I will just kind of uh, end with this. There are other things I can say, but I will just end with this. Uh, the new... The mainstreaming of uh, issue of personal responsibility simply means when you study neoliberal economics, you're going to find out that there's less emphasis on structure. It's on personal responsibility. And there's nothing wrong with that. But let me give you an example to illustrate this. All the persons here, most of the people here either teach uh, people who are working in the university, students that are students that are also faculty. Now, imagine we have a system where every time we're just talking about if there's any problem in the university or something like that, it's just the student. Draw something out of you, draw something out of you, this and that. Well, it's just true, the student has to be serious, but doesn't also the structure of the university and the faculty also have some role to play? So the problem with neoliberalism is that it prioritizes this idea of personal responsibility. And this is why there's, for instance, this book called uh, Death, of, um, Death of Despire, which is just documenting how there are many people who are white, uncollege, uh, non-college educated who feel a lot of despair in life because everything is about them, 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 them. So they're committing suicide. 
it has brought down the life expectancy of the United States. Why? Many of us do not know about this. But the point here is just that if everything is about myself, about myself, if I am unable to cope, I will just find an exit. Okay? The idea here is not to say that people should not be personally responsible, but there is a need for balance between how structures function and how, uh, how individuals also behave. So I'll just stop here. Oh, no, no, no. I have, do I have? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, the impact of neoliberal thinking on public policy. Let me talk a little bit about this. This is very interesting. The elimination and weakening of public guarantee of minimum social security. So you remember the libertarians do not want people to be taxed or something like that. The amazing thing is that one of the champions of neoliberalism, looking at society really very well, uh, that's Friedrich von Hayek, realized that if you don't take care of the poor, you are going to have problems in your society. Okay? Let's be frank about it. So taking care of the poor sometimes, it's not like you're not, you're just doing it for yourself. Yourself. Because if people are very frustrated, they're very angry, there's going to be more violence in the society. And we don't want to live in that kind of society. And if you read the work of Alexis de Tocqueville, there's a term he used, self-interest properly understood. Self-interest properly understood simply means that even if I'm going to be taxed so as to take care of some people who are desperately poor, my self-interest will tell me that if these people are happy and I can feel more secure in my society, I don't have to feel like somebody would go and at a gunpoint say they want the keys of my car or something like that, okay? So that's something really very important. But the neoliberals do not want to take any responsibility in that respect. And then creating new kind of human being. If you read the work of Margaret Thatcher, for instance, there's a documentary film, for instance, where the whole documentary film is about her. I've used it in some classes that I've taught. It's amazing when you see the party of policies she implemented, you would be surprised that she did that because she doesn't seem to have concern for people. So at the end of the documentary, they asked one of her cabinet members, what do you think is her legacy? He kept quiet for some time, and then he looked back at the camera and he said, she did not create selfishness. She did not create selfishness, but she legitimized it. That's her legacy. She did not create selfishness. Selfishness has always been existing in society, but she legitimized it. So there's a way new liberalism can legitimize selfishness. Okay? And I don't have the time to get into that because there's quite a lot of things we can talk about how selfishness is kind of uh, legitimized. For instance, in some language, they talk, things, they talk about things like the pursuit of legitimate aspirations. When you hear that, you feel like, wow. It sounds really nice. Well, wait until you go and check the details. You find out that this pursuit of legitimate aspirations is actually just kind of like crude selfishness that has been now packaged, covered with a separate canopy. It looks so nice. And then there's this idea of dismantling the welfare state. You know this very, very well. And the interesting thing is that as we live in America, if you read the book by Patrick Deneen called Why Liberalism Failed, liberalism doesn't have any clear destination for humanity. Christianity has an eschatology. You start here, you're going to end up here. But liberalism doesn't have any clear destination. It's just a competition for ideas. Today we are in America. If in the next four years or five years something happens and somebody powerful comes, they can move the country in a totally different direction that we never expected. And then in another five or ten years, we can move in totally another different direction. So it's just a marketplace of ideas. Okay. So, uh, so that's something that I am very, very concerned about. Uh, the idea is not that the state doesn't have its own problems. I can get into that if you are interested in, but I don't have the time to do that. I think there are probably two or three. Yeah, and then the ab abdication of moral and ethical judgment to the wisdom of crisis. Here, what I mean is that when you get deeply into neoliberalism, you find out that even people who are Christians are now relying more on the judgment of the market, the price system, rather than the whole question of the Holy Spirit or something like that. Sometimes... Actually, Christian organizations, they make decisions based on the market, based on price or whatever. But then after they make the decisions, they can go and kind of package it and then present it covered with a sacred canopy. Okay? And then finally, the urban center becomes the neoliberal paradise. If you notice in this country, there's a way we ignore rural people. Let's be frank about it. When I came to this country, I wanted to specialize in rural sociology. And I still maintain interest in what is happening in rural America. Many of us feel that what is America is just people who live in the urban center. Okay, because under neoliberalism, if you want to invest money, you are not concerned about the humanity of people 
what you are concerned about is where are you going to get the highest return on the dollar invested. Go and check Wall Street. You are not going to see a uh, corporation on Wall Street being uh, evaluated in terms of how many jobs have they created in the United States. No. Wall Street corporations are judged or evaluated in terms of when you invest money in them, what is the return on the dollar? Corporations that do that get a higher ranking. Okay? So what I'm saying here is that uh, when people feel investing money in the rural areas is not going to bring a higher return on the dollar, they just go and invest it in the urban center. And that's where we end up with some of the crisis. So thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. I, I kind of wish I could have gone first because it's really hard to follow Samuel. Um, but I'll spend a little time now talking about how to apply the social work lens to concepts of neoliberalism. And I want to just highlight, you know, as, as Samuel talked about the market as God and, <coughs> excuse me, the dismantling of the welfare state, those are the particular things that are of relevance to us as social work practitioners. So um, I first want to start on um, social work practice. So for the, uh, my colleagues who are here and how we design what we teach, it's based on nine competencies. And very quickly, I will just say what those are. And I've underlined the two that are of most significant relevance as we talk about the implications of neoliberalism. So we strive to um, be justice-informed practitioners who do ethical and professional practice. We strive to engage with diversity and difference in practice. Um, one of our core competencies, which is very uh, relevant to this conversation, is advancing social, economic, racial, and environmental justice, uh, research-informed practice and practice-informed research, and then justice-informed policy practice. Why? Because it is those policies that are in place that contribute to the systems that continue to perpetuate oppressive structures. And then these three engage, assess, and intervene with client systems. So we work across client systems, which includes individuals, families, groups, com communities, and organizations. And then finally, the evaluation of that. So this is what undergirds everything we teach and everything that we practice. Um, I wanted to just say sometimes with our students, we talk about the categorical, categorical imperative of Kant who says, so act as to treat humanity, whether in thine own person or in that of any other, in every case, as an end with all, never as a means only. So when we um, talk about and treat someone as a means to an end, that's the beginning of dehumanization and how we think about people as just a means to get somewhere else. So always respecting the humanity of others. The first thing I want to talk about in terms of the impact of neoliberalism is this notion of precarity, expanding precarity for the individual, increasing vulnerability of at-risk individuals, families, and communities, and citizens under the neoliberal state are substantively ignored in lieu of advancing global competitiveness. Those who are marginalized are increasingly at risk. Samuel also talked a little bit about the dismantling of the welfare system, so expanding precarity for social support systems. The rise of neoliberalism has seen a concurrent rise of inherent suspicion that is bred around the societal safety net and other programs which advance the common good. And that puts programs increasingly at risk. Those programs upon which our most vulnerable rely become uh, threatened under a neoliberal state. Generalization of precarity as a shared condition. For middle and upper, upper class people lucky, lucky enough to have a familial social safety net and social capital, precarity might figure primarily as a steady stream of anxiety and uncertainty about the future. However, for poor working class people who do not have access to privatized social protection, like inherited wealth, precarity figures more prominently as a deeply material and economic threat to confront day in and day out. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about is the normalization of crisis, or what we can call crisis ordinariness. More than ever before, 
Individuals, families, and communities that we serve in social work practice are impacted by extreme violence and trauma, influenced significantly by the rise of neoliberalism. Violence, both global and everyday, is increasingly unexceptional. People are living on the brink and oftentimes traumatized by life itself. We are living in times which are characterized by extreme violence, both at home and abroad. We think about Ukraine, Afghanistan, Syria, the secret drone strikes, police brutality, school sh shootings, militarized police forces who are increasingly empowered to turn on communities and its citizens. citizens. Um, another thing that has happened, and I don't think Samuel had a chance to get to this, but the role of the state changes. So because the role of the state morphs into that of protector of corporation and free markets, rather than the protector of society, marginalized individuals, families, and communities. Therefore, these very people, individuals, families, and communities, particularly those at risk, are increasingly, and again, made more vulnerable. And this is kind of going back to uh, the categorical imperative where people then begin to be used as a means to an end and are consequently dehumanized. An example of this is the emergence of the debate around personhood is the controversial Citizens United decision that sparked a lot of controversy. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it is the decision uh, made by the Supreme Court in 2010, where the Supreme Court invalidated strict federal campaign finance laws and upheld the First Amendment right of corporations and basically gave them the same rights as human persons. Um, this was a major victory for big oil, for Wall Street banks, and other powerful interest groups that frankly disregard people who are marginalized. Uh, care of self is yet another thing that is impacted in this neoliberal state. Um, living in competition breeds social alienation and disconnection at both the individual and societal levels. Neoliberal culture's command is to be constantly producing and performing. So for people who can't produce, for people who can't perform, they begin to lose their intrinsic uh, value and worth and the human dig dignity that we ascribe to that. Um, through this lens, human beings are increasingly commodified. Their worth tied only to what they can produce. And as a result, those who cannot perform or produce are increasingly dehumanized. Increasing levels of anxiety, I think many of us are familiar with this. It's evident across the social systems as a result of the dismantling of the welfare state, more particularly for the communities we serve and within that um, context of increasing competition. When coupled with the notion of individual responsibility, people are left on their own. And the more vulnerable they are, the more difficult it is for them to survive. In a systematic review, researchers analyzed data from dozens of studies and reported the, uh, an increase in the major depressive disorder, which increased 28% globally since the pandemic, and anxiety disorders, which increased 26% since the pandemic. So you can see those numbers out of 100,000. I wanna turn a little bit more to talk about the commodification of social work in the context of neoliberalism. Our social work practice is dependent on broken systems. So one of the important questions we have to ask ourselves is our practice designed to perpetuate these systems? And if so, are we just making suffering sufferable? There is an increasing threat to academic freedom as institutions increasingly develop formulate goals linked to economic and vocational imperatives, maintaining market shares, and reacting to industry demand. So we even see that here, like the importance of social work as a license program, or all of these programs that have pathways to being productive, right? So it begins to um, de-emphasize that really valuable piece of liberal arts education that is so important to understanding what does it mean to be human. Unwittingly, social work education and practice can be easily co-opted into uncritical acceptance of neoliberal discourses that support and entrench inequality. So one of the things that we have done in response to this is to develop our Justice Informed Master's Program where everything that we are trying to do and teach our students, we're actually now doing it in the undergraduate program, is for them to have a justice lens, a look and an analytical way 
to look at systems that continue to perpetuate this um, oppression within the context of the neoliberalism. neoliberalism. Instead of educating for emancipatory change, conservative approaches to pedagogy and the curriculum collude with neoliberal discourses to train practitioners to assess, treat, and manage apparently dysfunctional others while accepting existing inequalities in the system and making concessions to oppressive conditions rather than exposing the societal problems and injustices these create and seeking to change them. Again, that's our competency number four, four sorry, five, um, which is about justice in form policy work. We should promote instead focus on critical forms of social work that critique the dominant social structures and power relations, which cause broad social divisions and systemic inequity. Paolo Freire expressed that social workers have to be more than moral agents and that our attempts to be neutral result in the propagation of oppressive hegemonic systems. As social workers, we must concern ourselves with understanding and addressing the impacts of neoliberalism. What does that mean? It means that we critically examine our practice, which leads us to critically examine, examine the systems to assess whether the tenets of neoliberalism and globalization, again, as Samuel was talking about, where the market is God, have limited our objectives to be compliant with the dominant discourses rather than engaging in critically reflective, transformative learning and practice. It is our obligation as a part of our competency number one about professional and ethical practice to educate and train practitioners who foster social capital and community participation and step aside to leave space for the influence of those who are most left out of the systems built to maintain or which maintain neoliberalism. We regularly should be asking whose interests are served, who is at the table by these traditional social work roles and functions that we fall into and, and our how we're educating our students. We should critically think about how we apply social work theoretical frameworks to see who is given access to be in control and more importantly, who is left out. Examine and address oppressive underpinnings in our social work educational system by using anti-oppressive lenses and frameworks and to understand that critical theory is about human li liberation and emancipation. Where, again, where is our practice? Where is our education? What are we doing that's just making suffering sufferable? I'd like to go on uh, just to talk very briefly, uh, to take that a little deeper, because as we know, we are in the context of a Christian liberal arts context, which again, puts the stakes a little higher and allows us an opportunity to think about discussion around theologies that challenge the status quo. So part of what we are trying to build into our program and have discussion with students around is an exploration of theologies which teach about liberation and justice. For example, Latin American liberation theology, black liberation theology, evangelical theologies of liberation. So what does Latin American liberation theology teach us about liberation and justice? I don't have, well, one, I'm not an expert. You probably have to take a class in the BTS. But I can highlight a few things, and I'm going to just um, put in a couple quotes here from Gustavo Gutierrez. He says, um, but the poor person does not exist as an inescapable fact of destiny. His or her existence is not politically neutral, and it is not ethically innocent. The poor are a byproduct of the system in which we live and for which we are responsible. They are marginalized by our social and cultural world. They are oppressed, exploited proletariat, robbed of the fruit of their labor and despoiled of their humanity. Hence, the poverty of the poor is not a call to generous relief action, but a demand that we go and build a different social order. Now I'm going to tie that directly back again to our policy practice. We are there, yes, to serve people in crisis, but we are also there as social workers to change the social order, to build a new social order, to create new policies and challenge structures that um, perpetuate this cycle. Gutierrez says theology is reflection, a critical attitude. The commitment of love, of service, and service is one of our core principles, comes first. Theology follows. It is the second step. Faith is not limited to affirming the existence of God. No, faith tells us that, love, that God loves us and demands a loving response. 
This response is given through love for human beings, and that is what we mean by commitment to God and our neighbor. This critical question, is the church fulfilling a purely religious role when by its silence or friendly relationships, it lends legitimacy to dictatorial and oppressive government? And then I love this, so you say you love the poor, then name them. That is our call to engage with and walk with and learn from and stand beside and create space for the people who are marginalized and who are on the outside. Let's look for a moment at black liberation theology and James Cone, who says, the scandal is that the gospel means liberation, that this liberation comes to the poor and that it gives them the strength and the courage to break conditions of servitude. And yet the Christian gospel is more than a transcendent reality, more than going to heaven when I die to shout salvation as I fly. It is also an imminent reality, a powerful liberating presence among the poor right now in their midst, building them up where they are torn down, torn down by our systems and propping them up every leaning side. The gospel is found wherever poor people struggle for justice, fighting for their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then James Cone goes on to say this, the cross and the lynching tree interpret each other. Both were public spectacles, shameful events, instruments of punishment reserved for the most despised people in society. Any genuine theology and any genuine preaching of the Christian gospel must be measured against the test of the scandal of the cross and the lynching tree. Jesus did not die a gentle death like Socrates with his cup of hemlock. Rather, he died like a lynched black victim or a common black criminal in torment on the tree of shame. The crowd shouts, crucify him. Anticipated the white mob shout, lynch him. Jesus agonizing final cry of abandonment from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? was similar to the lynch victim Sam Jose's awful scream as he drew his last breath, oh my God, oh Jesus. In each case, it was a cruel, agonizing and contemptible death. Let's consider just for a moment evangelical theories of liberation. White evangelicals often portrayed liberation theology as antithetical to evangelicalism because of the invariable connection with Marxist thought, many evangelicals tend to reject liberation theology as a communist and hence non-biblical approach without simultaneously addressing US complicity in supporting repressive regimes. With the emergence of a focus on justice work as an expression of faith, which we see in many evangelical circles more recently, the idea that the pursuit of emancipation and oppression is antithetical to the core tenets of evangelicalism is increasingly contested. Evangelical tenets of faith can inform justice-rooted liberation in praxis. J. Denny Weaver, in his book, The Nonviolent Atonement, which I highly recommend, says, New, Jerusal New, Jerusalem, <laughs> New Jerusalem is found wherever human community resists the way of empire and places God at the center of its shared life. As a department of social work, we believe that our integration of faith and learning informs our Christian liberal arts learning context, as well as our approach to the sacred work of advancing human rights, social, economic, and environmental justice. It should say racial in there as well. Um, and that's the way for me, I don't know how, other, how else other to express my faith other than this work of justice that I believe God calls us to. There are biblical mandates to end oppression, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring righteousness and justice to the fatherless and to the weak, plead the widow's cause, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, love kindness, walk humbly, deliver who has been robbed from the oppressor and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the widow, nor shed innocent blood, Open your mouth for all who are destitute. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the sojourner or the poor and needy. Learn to do good. And again, seek justice and correct oppression. 
Um, I heard a sermon recently, and Samuel and I talked a little bit about uh, about this, about forgiveness and repentance. The tax collector who encounters Jesus doesn't just pay back what he stole. He gives back four times the amount. So if we know the legacies that we have created through history and through policies, then shouldn't we respond in such a way to that and uh, seek repentance? About human dignity and the intrinsic sacred value of human beings, scriptures say that human beings are made in the image of God and therefore sacred. Translating a deeper understanding of the concept of the intrinsic sacredness of individuals, families, and communities is essential to engaging in a truly transformative social work practice, which critically, engaged social, critically engages social workers in the advancement of human rights, social, economic, racial, and environmental justice, and justice-driven policy practice. I love these sayings of Ronald Niebuhr. The ego, which falsely makes itself the center of its existence in its pride and will to power, inevitably subordinates other life to its will. We think about in the context of that neoliberalism where market is God and the ego. And then he also says, "If this is so beautiful, if perfect love is the sacrifice of self, sin is the assertion of self against others, Sin, in this neoliberal context, is always trying to be strong at the expense of someone else. And so in closing, I think about um, when I took a philosophy class in undergraduate school and I was first introduced to Martin Buber's I, Thou, I, It philosophical construct, and I think it's very applicable. Um, and so I put together this, this thing, this little visual. So the I, It view of humanity rooted in neoliberal, neoliberalism, market is God. Individuals are commodified. They're viewed as human capital. Their rights are violated. They're only of, uh, considered to be of worth if they can produce and perform. Corporations have the same rights as human beings. And that safety net disappears because people don't care. People don't care in that context because we care about ego and self. So individuals, families, and communities are increasing that risk versus this I thou, I thou view of humanity which rejects the tenets of neoliberalism. Human rights and personal dignity are upheld. There's decreasing stress and violence. We then decide, yes, funding for programs which enhance the well-beings of families is important to us as a community in terms of advancing the common good. Those who are invisible, so many are made visible. Human suffering decreases. And from a social work perspective, social, economic, racial, and environmental justice is advanced. So this is why it matters to us to understand neoliberalism. Thank you very much. And if we have any questions, Samuel will answer them. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any questions? We have two minutes. Please no, don't ask me anything. <laughs> The term neoliberalism is just so confusing because it, it seems like it's not what it says it is. I mean, you know, laissez-faire capitalism does, is not liberalism by any understanding I have. So how did that come to be that it's called neoliberalism, but it seems like it's not? OK. Uh, my <laughs> response to that is that actually, uh, there are conservatives who do not believe in neoliberalism. So there are people who think about laissez-faire capitalism, but they don't push some of their arguments as far as neoliberals. Neoliberalism is a moral philosophy. It's not just an economic uh, theory, as some people really assume. It's a moral philosophy. And when you study the theory very, very carefully, you see that it is applied in so many areas. Like when you apply it to the family, they say children are durable consumer goods. Purely economic, OK? Children are durable consumer goods. And when they try to explain how Christianity started in Rome, they said the difference is that there were a lot of other deities in Roman Republic or whatever, but these deities were in charge of different areas of human life. And every day you wake up in the morning, you have to go and bribe according to them each of these deities so that he or she can take care of this part of your life. And if you bribe them, they can abscond with the money according to them. But the Christian God is like one super Walmart, super target. You go there, he takes care of everything. And they say that's the reason why Christianity survived. 
<laughs> it's a purely economic argument based on efficiency. So the problem with neoliberal neoliberalism is that it is a moral philosophy if you think very deeply about that. Laissez faire capitalism, yes, they just, they just talk about the deregulation of uh, the economy, allow just like the market to just operate or something, but they don't push their argument as far as neoliberalism does. Neoliberalism, in my view, is a huge moral philosophy that many Christians do not really understand. As I said much earlier, if you really understand the theory really very well, the price system replaces the role of the Holy Spirit. But they don't tell you that. Most Americans are afraid of Marxist analysis or theory. But if they really understand neoliberalism, they should even be more concerned about that. Because economists can make sophisticated arguments, but they don't talk the way the Marxists will talk or something like that. So I hope that really uh, helps. Thank you. Thank you very much.